coming on the air with the travel trouble maybe hitting thousands this holiday weekend. The nasty wet weather millions are going to have to brace for. We're live in Atlanta. We are also live on the scene in Baltimore with divers going back in the water tonight for the massive cleanup of this bridge collapse with no timeline right now. This huge crane, you're about to see it coming in to help. The president's set to go next week and new details on just how dangerous this could be. Then in tonight's original, a big pay raise coming for fast food workers in California, but could some of them lose their jobs because of it? We've lost our papers, we'll see. Plus, our newsmaker tonight, the most popular candidate for president, maybe literally anybody else. And now you can vote for him, a real person who's changed his name. He's going one-on-one -on -one with us in just a couple of minutes. And the music, Beyonce says, is her best ever. So will it finally win her album of the year? That's coming up a little later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight we start with that busy travel weekend as millions of people are heading out maybe for spring break, maybe for the Easter weekend, but some bad weather could be a problem for flights or even your picnic plans. You've got a big storm moving into California that has more than 20 million people under flood watches through Sunday. We're talking the potential for rain, for snow, for a ton of wind, and the holiday travel surge could also affect flights all across the country. Here are some of the trouble spots, right? The FAA says next week will be the busiest of the season. As far as today, we've seen about 2,800 flight delays, 60 cancellations. Not the worst thing in the world, but not the best if you're one of those 60 flights. Priya Shadar is at Atlanta Airport, and meteorologist Angie Lastman is covering it for us. Priya, let's start with you. Lots going on this weekend. What's the expectation? Yeah, that's right, Hallie. Well, it's really a triple whammy when it comes to travel between Easter, like you said, spring break, and then also that total solar eclipse that's scheduled for April 8th. The airport officials here in Atlanta said that they were expecting 7.6 million travelers to pass through this airport between March 14th and April 7th. And the busiest day in that three-week period, actually today, with 335,000 passengers expected to travel through here. What's unique about this specific spring break uh, period is that it, that level of travel is actually being sustained over the next week, as you mentioned, with the FAA expecting 50,000 travelers per day almost every single day next week. They're expecting a spike on April 4th and 5th as a result of that uh, solar eclipse that I mentioned. And you're seeing people traveling to unusual destinations like Dallas, Buffalo, Cleveland, and Indianapolis. So it's interesting because we're going to see airports perhaps in other parts of the country where you didn't typically see see such high volume of passengers going through there for spring break specifically also see um, a high number of passengers. So they're telling people to get to the airport early, two and a half hours if you can. Also try to hitch a ride with someone or maybe take an Uber to the airport because they're expecting that parking could be limited. And if you're going to hit the roads, as you mentioned, there are some weather conditions to be aware of. The good news is that gas prices are actually only around $3.54 right now. It's a little bit higher than last year year, but nowhere near the over $5 gas prices that we saw back in 2022, Hallie. Well, and you got a lot of folks thankful that that is not, in fact, the case. Priya, thank you very much. Meteorologist Angie Lastman is joining us now. Okay, so talk us through the forecast. Talk us through the expectation here. Yeah, so Hallie, here's the deal. We got to watch the West Coast from today, tomorrow, even into Sunday, and we'll slowly but surely start to see that system work its way east. But in the meantime, we're already gearing up for a busy Friday afternoon and Friday evening in this region. We've got San Francisco that has been just dealing with plenty of rain through the day today. We're going to have repeated rounds of some heavy rain working through California over the next day or so. There's the system that we're going to be watching. And preemptively, before this works into Southern California, we've got flood watches that are up from San Luis Obispo and including Santa Barbara, L.A., and down to San Diego. 21 million people included in that. And get this, this lasts through the weekend. Likely till Sunday, we'll see some of those flood alerts. This area has had, you know, relentless kind of winter, start of spring. They've had plenty of rain. They're oversaturated in a lot of these spots, and it doesn't take much to see the landslides and the mudslides. So that's what we're going to watch. By the time we get into the later parts of the day today, into the evening, overnight hours, and into tomorrow, we'll start to see Southern California get in on this action. We'll have many of those rain bands rotating into parts of the desert southwest, causing some problems from Nevada to Arizona, out towards Utah. But the flood risk that we're most concerned about is where you saw that bright, that bright green flood watch. From L.A. to San Diego, where we'll see multiple rounds of this rain working in, not just today and into tomorrow, but by the time we get into Easter as well. The Rockies will get in on the snow action as well. I know it's the end of March. You're waiting for us to wrap up the snow forecasting, but that's not going to happen just yet. 
when it comes to the rain, I, I think the more widespread amounts that we're not so concerned about across parts of the southwest, it's going to be a quarter of an inch, a half of an inch. But look at places like Santa Barbara and L.A. We're talking three to five inches in some of those spots. We've seen it time and time again. We know that the landslides, the mudslides are really concerning. So that's why we're watching that specifically. And in a very busy travel weekend, just as Priya said, when it comes to the snowfall totals, a foot, maybe two feet in some of these spots, especially across the Sierra range, that's where we'll see that additional snow for folks there. When it comes to the good news, because there is good news, especially when we're looking at our holiday forecast for Sunday, there's a couple of spots that we're going to see really nice conditions. Much of the south, you'll see really great conditions. How about Egg Bend, Louisiana, where it'll be into the low 80s, dealing with some clouds, but you're not going to see much rain. That goes for folks along the east coast as well. We'll have a couple of spots across parts of the Great Lakes, the Midwest, where you'll see temperatures mid 70s to 80s, but you will have to contend with some rain. And then notice this is all part of that same system where we are just going to be watching the additional snow, the additional rain for folks in the western third of the country across parts of the Rockies and across parts of the southwest. Unfortunately, for Flower Pot, Arizona, yes, that is a city, 50 degrees and dealing with some rain for their Sunday Easter forecast. Hallie, that's something that uh, will call for a plan B, maybe some indoor plans for our friends in Easter Cross, California as well. Angie Lastman, thank you very much for that, uh, that breakdown of it all. Appreciate it. Let's take you to Baltimore now. And tonight, a massive, a complicated, a dangerous cleanup mission there with the Army Corps of Engineers calling it one of the biggest challenges they've ever faced. We've got President Biden heading to the city next week as the biggest crane on the eastern seaboard. Look at it right there. It's now on the scene of that catastrophic bridge collapse, along with hundreds of tons of twisted metal and concrete in this huge operation to clear the really important channel here in the Patapsco River and to reopen one of the nation's busiest ports. It has now been four days since the deadly collapse killed at least six construction workers. State officials late today are announcing a plan for a new scholarship for the children of those men who died on the job. We're just learning divers will go into those frigid waters. It's dark, it's cold. They're gonna go in with lights, with torches to try to cut apart the chunks of steel. As the governor of Maryland warns, cleanup and rebuilding will take a very long time. The big part and one of the challenges is that the key bridge, which sits on top of the vessel right now, that that weight is somewhere between three and 4,000 tons. So our team needs to cut that truss into sections in a safe, in a responsible, and in an efficient way before it can lift those pieces out of the water. Tom Costello is following this for us live from Baltimore. He is joining us now. And Tom, what is very clear is that this mission uh, is going to be extremely sensitive. They've got to be extremely careful given the yeah. weight, given the force of what has happened here after the ship slammed into the bridge. Yeah, and by the way, there are still four uh, unaccounted for construction workers who are in the water. Uh, and so they're very mindful of the fact that they need to recover those those bodies. Let me just give you the latest stats coming from the governor's office about how big of a flotilla is in route right now to help in this. In all, seven floating cranes, 10 tugboats, nine barges, nine salvage vessels, full five Coast Guard vessels also will be a part of this massive uh, operation. Now, they are now positioning on site. As you saw, that massive crane has now arrived, but they want to get more equipment on site. They want to stage all of this, and then they need to look at all of the data they're gathering right now because they've been the army corps of engineers as you know we were out there with them yesterday they are mapping the entire uh, wreckage area the debris field with sonar with lidar as well as just getting underwater as best they can with divers. However, the divers are not in the water now. It's simply too dangerous. And the problem is, to your point about the, the wreckage, the twisted metal, it is razor sharp. And they're very concerned that somebody, a diver, might sustain a potentially lethal injury if they get too close to a razor sharp piece of that bridge. So that's the challenge. They want to know where every piece is, and then they're going to go in with the torches you suggested and cut down and cut apart the pieces of the bridge. Just that piece on the ship, you heard them say, is 4,000 tons. Just that piece. That doesn't even count all the rest of the, of the bridge that is in the water. So this is a massive operation, very, very dangerous, very and there's, dangerous. There's and they're also not going to rush it. They're going to do it right.
Tom, I'm so sorry. I didn't interrupt you there, friend. I just, as we're looking at some of these images here and we're seeing um, the, the, the containers essentially stacked up on the ship, that is another level of danger yeah. as well. Pull on that thread because they've got to be incredibly careful. There's not some sort of spill. There's not some sort of issue with what's already on the ship. Right. Absolutely, and I was on that uh, Army Corps of Engineer boat yesterday right up to the ship and, and literally looking up like this at those containers. Uh, the whole ship is stacked with containers, right? We know that 56 of them have some sort of hazardous material not thought to be extremely dangerous. In some cases, it's just it's liquid soap and oils and that kind sure. of thing. Nonetheless, they want to make sure that every single container that is at risk of falling off or that is a hazmat concern that they secure those containers and secure the entire ship. And you know what happens, Hallie, when you, you can imagine, right? You, you bring up, eventually, they lift up that beam that's laying on that ship. They lift it up. And what's going to happen to the ship? They don't know. They know that right now it is pushed so far down. The, the bow, the nose is pushed so far down into the water. It's literally into the mud 50 feet down. So what happens when you release the pressure and it starts to rise again? Is that ship seaworthy? They don't know. So the Coast Guard has an immense job ahead of it. The Army Corps of Engineers, the Navy, not to mention, of course, the, the state police and the state police divers, they're bringing in professional dive teams, of the marine dive teams that are contracted for the Army Corps of Engineers. It's a massive, massive yeah. job. They're not going to start this overnight. Tom Costello, live for us there in Baltimore. Uh, another day of intense coverage there. Tom, thank you for being there. Let's take you overseas now because the leader of one of Haiti's most powerful gangs, a guy named Barbecue, as they call him, is telling Sky News he's open to calling for a ceasefire if his organization of armed gangs is included in peace talks. Listen. We are in dialogue. We are in dialogue. We are always in dialogue. But the group that is in dialogue, the political class that is in dialogue, is not in dialogue. The reason is because they are not in Haiti in the heart of them. The class that is in dialogue is an exclusion. The class that is in dialogue is a bandit that is in dialogue. Mais son façon pour renouveler le système là, Jean Lia, parce que le système là il vient en boucle. He's talking about the political class, the political system that he believes has reached his end, with barbecue becoming this, really the face of Haiti's collapse into violence. He and the armed gangs he leads, saying the country has been controlled by corrupt politicians for more than a decade. The UN now calling what's happening in Haiti cataclysmic, saying there has to be immediate action, bold action. They say more than 1,500 people have been killed because of gang violence this year alone. Guad Venegas is following this story for us. And Guad, it is very rare access to this gang leader here who's also telling Sky News the possibility of more violence is not over. He is. So he seems to be the most powerful person or individual in Haiti at the moment. You know, and as we've had conversations with members of the Haitian American community here in Miami who are in touch with friends and family in Haiti, we always talk about the gangs and why they think, I ask him, why they think they have so much power. And what they tell us is that, well, these gangs also offer protection for a lot of the individuals that live in neighborhoods where there are no police officers and there's no other type of government. So one of the reasons why these gangs are so powerful is because they are backed by neighborhoods or by residents that have no other option. We've been waiting now for some time for this uh, presidential council uh, that was set to then get together and officially name an interim prime uh, minister that would then try to take the country into the next step, which would be to hold, to hold elections. Uh, that seems to be the one thing that everyone agrees on in Haiti and the Haitian American community here uh, that we've spoken to is that they want to see elections. But uh, with the amount of violence and the no government in place, it's difficult to think that elections would be held uh, anytime soon. As for the Americans that were in Haiti when this violence escalated, the U.S. government has been working hard to evacuate those that have asked for help. The federal government has been able to evacuate more than 400 Americans. And then you also have the state of Florida. Uh, the Florida Division of Emergency Management has been able to evacuate more than 100 Floridians. And these efforts, Helly, are incredibly difficult because they need to to contract private security on the ground. Those uh, security officers have to go door to door, 
to, uh, to be able to rescue the individuals, the Americans, and then sometimes even use helicopters to take them to where the airplanes are at that can then bring them to the United States. Um, at least the state of Florida has been doing that. The U.S. federal government has also been using helicopters to get people out of Haiti and into the Dominican Republic. And then there's the question of that Kenyan peacekeeping force that the United Nations agreed on. Uh, Kenya already said that they won't be sending in that peacekeeping force unless there's a government in place and a prime minister in place. But that was sort of the solution that was proposed by the international community. But at the same time, Hallie, Haitians say they want to figure this out on their own without the influence from the international community. So it's just very difficult to see what's going to happen next. You know, we had a top State Department official on the show, I think it was just about 48 hours ago, asked him about this issue of weapons coming into Haiti, um, the weapons that are being used. I know that you've been doing some exclusive reporting on this with access now to seized weapons. What else can you tell us? Hallie, we've seen the images of the gangs walking yep. around the streets with those guns, the same guns that members of the military have. So what you're seeing here are images of the seized weapons that Homeland Security Investigation has been able to find in shipments that were going to Haiti. Now, these are weapons that soldiers use. I'm not a weapons expert, but what I was told is some of these are called anti-material rifles, which means they can pierce through walls, vehicles, even sandbags. Those are the types of weapons that are being smuggled into Haiti. We were able to go into the Office of Homeland Security Investigations and see these weapons in person. And we also went to an area, a very particular part of Miami. Now, this is key to the smuggling. In Miami, we have an area, which is the Port of Miami at the Miami River, with smaller uh, freighters. Now, these freighters are allowed to have shipments with uh, smaller goods or secondhand goods that people take to an area, to like a warehouse, and they say, I want to send this to Haiti, a few boxes, and they're allowed to to put these boxes in the freighter without those having to go in containers and going through the formal process that usually takes place when you ship things abroad. This is because that's the way things have been going into the Caribbean. Now, the smugglers or criminal organizations are taking advantage of that system to be able to hide a lot of these weapons and boxes and a lot of the humanitarian aid that needs to go from Haiti into that area. Here's part of the conversation that I had with one of the agents. Is this a daily occurrence that you guys are finding weapons? It's a very regular regular occurrence. It, it sometimes daily, ebb and flow with it, but yeah, it wouldn't be uncommon to get daily weapon seizures coming out of Miami. So again, incredibly difficult to stop because we don't have enough people to check every box and they have to keep those shipments going because a lot of food and humanitarian aid goes from the U.S. to Haiti through that route. Squad Venegas, Squad, it's important reporting. We're glad that you're bringing it to us tonight. And more of it, thanks, Squad, will air tonight on Top Story with Top, uh, Tom Yamas at 7 o'clock Eastern, right here on NBC News Now. Do not miss that. Lots to come on this Friday night. Also, just into us now, we're learning from the Vatican. Pope Francis will skip the traditional Good Friday Stations of the Cross at the Colosseum in Rome. He was supposed to lead the ceremony. This is a live look right here at the ceremony. It is happening as we speak, obviously, in Rome. It's later than it is here in the United States. That's why it's dark. The Vatican says this is meant to preserve the Pope's health ahead of tomorrow's vigil and Easter Sunday Mass. He'll watch tonight's ceremony from his home instead. This is the only event Pope Francis has missed so far in this very busy Holy Week leading up to Easter, the most sacred time for Catholics around the world. He actually had to skip this last year because of cold weather. Remember, that's right after he got out of the hospital where he was treated for bronchitis. He's still planning to be at the rest of his events on the schedule this year, giving mass and trying to portray some strength after fighting health issues these last four months. Remember, he's 87. He's had intestinal surgery. He's had lung inflammation all in just the past year. We're going to be keeping an eye on this and have more coverage tonight and throughout the weekend, of course, what's happening at Rome for Easter weekend here on the show. So the Pope, not the only one scaling down Easter weekend plans. The royal family is as well. After the palace announced Prince William and Princess Kate would be skipping Easter. Obviously, that's after her announcement that she's being treated for cancer. Kensington Palace, remember, had said initially way back when that Easter would be the first day she'd come back to public duties after abdominal surgery. They said that back when we first learned of the surgery. That's typically a time when you see the whole royal family together. The palace says the king, who is also going through treatment for cancer, will be at services this weekend. I want to get to Josh Letterman on this. Okay, Josh, um, different looking Easter, right? Not unexpected based on some of what's going on, the health issues that the royal family faces. But talk us through what we expect short term and maybe even medium to long term here. 
Well, hopefully this will not be the new normal, Hallie, where we have some of the top royals uh, out of sight, right? I mean, this is supposed to be a temporary situation while they are fighting cancer. And this has already become something that we've gotten used to uh, over the last few months. We haven't seen Princess Kate hold a public event since December ahead of that surgery that she had in uh, January, which was, of course, before they discovered uh, that she, she actually had cancer. And at the time uh, that she had surgery in January anticipated that she'd be in the public eye holding events after Easter. Now that we know that they found uh, that there had been cancer present and she's undergoing preventative chemo, we don't know whether that time will be older will be longer until her. And as far as the king, who also had surgery in January, uh, they realized that he had cancer. You know, they've tried to find ways to put him out there for him to be accessible, even though with a compromised immune system, he can't be out and about like he would be uh, at a typical Easter, shaking hands with people and interacting with the public. It kind of reminds me in a way of COVID when we got used to trying to interact with people uh, via Zoom or other ways where we weren't directly exposed. And so we've seen the palace uh, put him out uh, in videos uh, in terms of react uh, interactions he's had with the Prime Minister and others, uh, including in a recording they released uh, yesterday. Normally, he would have given uh, a speech for Holy Thursday. Instead, they released an audio recording of the King. Listen to what he had to say. We need and benefit greatly from those who extend the hand of friendship to us, especially in a time of need. The king seemed to be alluding there to uh, all of the well wishes that have been coming uh, toward him and his family as both he and Princess Kate are now fighting cancer. Uh, and while that was an audio recording, we didn't get to see him yesterday. We do expect uh, that the king will be visible on Sunday at the uh, Easter service uh, at Windsor Castle, uh, even though he won't be quite as public as he would have been in years past. We do expect both he and Queen Camilla will attend that service. But we are told that uh, Princess Kate, uh, Prince William, and their three kids, they are planning to lay low this Easter and stay totally out of the public eye. Hallie. Josh Letterman, live for us there overseas. Josh, thank you. To a decision now on that long-awaited menthol cigarette ban that could be delayed again. A decision we were supposed to see at the end of last year. It was pushed to this month, and it may get punted more. Public health advocates have been working to ban menthol cigarettes for years. Data shows it would lead to one in four menthol smokers quitting smoking altogether if it were to be banned. The FDA says more than half a million deaths could have been avoided over the last four decades if these kinds of cigarettes were not in the U.S. anymore. I want to bring in Aaron Gilchrist near the White House. Um, explain to us here, right, there's some political implications. What has the quote-unquote holdup been? Yeah, well, so, Hallie, I mean, this has been a, a controversial issue off and on over, over several years. As you mentioned, there are public health groups that have been anticipating some action from the White House on this ban this month, have you, after, as you said, after the ban was, was sort of punted back in December, uh, was really quietly delayed by the White House. Now, we've been tracking this rulemaking process that the FDA decisions like this have to go through. There's a, an Office of Management and Budget website that indicated really a final decision would come this month or could come this month. And now we are past the close of business for today on the last business day of the month and no ban. And so we don't expect that we're going to be seeing that happen anytime soon. As you noted, public health experts have been pushing to ban menthol cigarettes for some time now. They say that the science on this is clear and that black Americans in particular seem to be targeted by the marketers of these menthol cigarette products and more adversely impacted by this type of cigarette. FDA data showing that 85% of black smokers use menthol cigarettes compared to about 30% of white smokers. And there's some research that suggests that we could see more than half a million lives saved by a ban like this. The tobacco industry has been fighting the idea of a ban, saying that it would create or potentially could create uh, an illegal market for cigarettes. And as you noted, this is something that the Biden uh, administration has not commented on widely uh, as we've been looking at this ban coming from the FDA. It is an election year. Uh, and so we know that this is a this is a ban that would impact a key voting block, a key part of the Biden coalition, if you will. And so we'll be looking to see if this is an action that gets taken this year, Hallie, uh, before the election or something that happens after. 
Aaron Gilchrist live for us there outside the White House. Aaron, thank you so much. Lots more to get to after the break, including millions of Americans spending now like there's no tomorrow. New numbers out today explain the so-called YOLO economy. And does your brain kind of work a lot like Instagram? A new study says maybe. We've got that next. Are you spending money like there's no tomorrow? Turns out thousands of Americans are, with new data showing that we are in what's being called a YOLO economy. That's how the Washington Post puts it. Totally different reaction now, right, than after the 2008 recession, or even going back to the Great Depression. What is a YOLO economy? It means a lot of people are spending a lot more money on like big, flashy stuff. Live entertainment is up $9 billion from before COVID. Travel internationally, those foreign trips, nearly $40 billion more from 2019 to now. Of course, if you're spending on that, probably not saving as much. And you can see that in the chart here. Before the pandemic, Americans put away like 8% of their paychecks. This huge spike, obviously, in April 2020, heart of the COVID pandemic, now down to just 4%. The Fed's preferred data today showing prices up 2.5% from February of last year to this year. Brian Chung is joining us now. What's interesting is this idea of like a YOLO economy is reflected in some of these new inflation numbers showing things like services are up, goods down. Yeah, and one important thing to note, though, about the yellow economy is that it's only for a subsect of the economy, right? I mean, those that are lower income are likely not splurging on some of those more luxurious things. But look, at the end of the day, this is all reflected in the aggregate numbers that we get in the form of the personal consumption expenditures. It's just a boring term that describes one measure of inflation. And this shows that prices over the year over year period, February of this year compared to February of last year, went up by 2.5%. On a monthly basis compared to January, it went up by 0.3%. So prices are still going up. But interestingly, it's different depending on what type of price you're looking at. So prices for the things that we buy, goods, have actually gone down year over year by 0.2%, not much. But take a look at services. So paying for people to do stuff for us has gotten a lot more expensive, 3.8%. What are specifically getting more expensive? Things like, for example, airfare, as you mentioned. So you look at international airfare specifically, that is getting more expensive. Also take a look at financial services and insurance, motor vehicles and parts. And not just that, it's also insurance. So these are the things, again, that are services you Usually. You're paying for someone to fly you from New York to Los Angeles. You are paying for someone to manage your money. You're paying for someone to fix your car. So these are all really interesting facets of the economy, even several years out from the pandemic, Hallie. Okay, so the next question to our resident Fed expert, what, is, what do these numbers mean for what the Fed could do about interest rates? I thought you'd never ask, Hallie. Well, <laughs> what all this tells us is that the Federal Reserve is still really not expected to do all that much. That's because right now the expectation is when the Fed meets next on May 1st that they won't cut interest rates and they haven't cut interest rates for the last few months, although they also haven't further raised interest rates. Now, the question is, when will they start to cut interest rates? As this guy, Jerome Powell, has teased before. He's the head of the Federal Reserve. That could begin in June. Now, for what it's worth, these uh, expectations are coming from market pricing. Uh, investors are betting that it might happen in June. If that happens, maybe that offers a little bit of alleviation to the things that interest rates are tied to, like mortgage rates, like car rates, like uh, credit card rates, which have been very elevated as of late. So we'll have to watch what this guy said. This guy actually spoke today, and he was mentioning that the inflation numbers that we got this morning seem to be in line with the expectation that the okay. Fed might cut interest rates at some point. We just don't know when, Hallie. Brian Chung, uh, I'm glad we got that in. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Good to see you on the show. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, it's the hundreds of thousands of fast food workers in California who will get a little more cash in their pockets starting Monday. It's because a new law will kick in, raising the minimum wage to 20 bucks an hour, up from 16 that is huge for workers because of those higher costs we just talked about. But some business owners we heard from worry what it means for them. Might they have to close their doors because of it? Here's Maura Barrett with more. The $4 an hour pay raise could boost paychecks for an estimated 500,000 fast food workers in California. But in the lead up to the new $20 minimum wage policy taking effect April 1st, business owners like Amir Samadi in San Jose project a pinch. As an owner or as an employer, you have to have like coverage to pay them. If you cannot, you have to shut your door. During the pressure of the pandemic, Samadi says he didn't lay off any workers or cut hours. With the new increase, though, he's not sure he can afford that same protection. A collective of franchisees for Pizza Hut and Roundtable Pizza already indicated plans to lay off at least 1,200 delivery drivers this year, according to the Wall Street Journal. 
Roundtable Pizza tells NBC News the franchisee is transferring their delivery services to third party, calling it unfortunate, but we look at this as a transfer of jobs. Pizza Hut has not returned our request for comment and has not said publicly the change is connected to the new law. Others said they've paused hiring or cut back on workers' hours. Governor Gavin Newsom signed the FAST Act into law last fall. This is a big deal. $20 an hour. Requiring the pay bump at any fast food chain with 60 or more locations nationwide, like Pizza Hut or Panera Bread. That's a 25% increase from the state's broader $16 minimum wage, which had grown over the last eight years. It's a result in part from a decade of fight for $15 protests. The movement now ballooning to a fight for $20 motto in response to inflation and higher cost of living. But this law is just for one industry, those who work in fast food. What is the point of having a separate minimum wage for fast food workers versus just across the board? It's very, very unusual to have a separate minimum wage for a particular sector. I still think there's this common misconception that Oh, well, that business owner makes a lot of money. They can afford it. That might be true, right? Um, but that doesn't mean they won't change their behavior. When the minimum wage goes, goes up, some low skilled workers lose their jobs. And while it threatens those jobs, consumers could be eating the new cost too. McDonald's, Chipotle, and Jack in the Box have already said they'd raise menu prices in response to the law, creating several losers in a play that was sold as one that would win. Maura is joining us now. Maura, it's great to see you here on set in Washington. Um, so as we're looking ahead to what happens Monday there, right? I know you've been talking with experts here with some questions about whether a pay raise like this actually is the most effective way to help workers. Basically, economists... It feels like it should be. It seems like it, point blank, right? But the way it looks to economists, when you dig a little deeper, they told me it's essentially political theater. It makes people like Governor Newsom look really good because it says he's doing something. But what happens is you raise the minimum wages, the businesses feel like we laid out in the package there, but also you don't have to raise taxes, and then you don't really see any changes in the budget, budget deficit. It really just hurts those employees when the businesses can't keep up. Now, there is a real need for wage adjustment when it comes to this industry. The fast food industry actually has more workers living in poverty than any other industry. Right. But economists tell me that something like a tax credit for those workers would be more effective. That's interesting. Maura Barrett, thank you so much for that reporting. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Syria blaming Israel for airstrikes that killed more than 40 people overnight. The strikes reportedly hit missile depots belonging to Hezbollah. One human rights group calling it the deadliest such attack in years. Israeli officials have not commented on the strikes. Number two, the family of Riley Strain now calling for a second autopsy. Remember, he's the 22-year-old student from Missouri who went missing on a trip to Nashville. His body was found about two weeks later. His family says the autopsy has only raised more questions, like why he was found with no pants, no shoes. They say they want more details about what happened. Police say Strain's death continues to appear accidental. Number three, France looking for help from other countries to make sure the Olympics are safe this summer. The government's reached out to about 46 other nations, asking them to send a couple thousand police officers to Paris. That's after France raised its security alert to the highest level after that attack on a Russian concert hall. Number four, Oppenheimer, premiering in Japan today, eight months after the movie was released around the rest of the world. Remember, the film got some criticism for its marketing approach in Japan, with some moviegoers telling the Associated Press they like it. But the former mayor of Hiroshima saying the horror of nuclear weapons was not sufficiently depicted. He still says he's encouraging people to go see it. Number five, a new study on experiments in mice is giving us some new insight into how our brains could form memories. Researchers studying mice in mazes say the brain sends out signals to essentially tag certain experiences when they're awake. Then when they're asleep, they replay those same signals over and over again, sort of like saving memories for later. Scientists say it shows how important sleep or rest may be to creating permanent memories. And isn't it funny? It kind of works like your favorite Instagram post. You click like, you got it, you can go back to it, that kind of thing. Coming up here on NBC News Exclusive, why the CAA's top cyber expert tells her own kids not to touch TikTok, and why this fish in Florida may spin itself into extinction. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, take a look at this video. A man chasing a woman down a street in New York, following her for several stops on the subway. 
The NYPD says the man even followed her after she moved train cars, then ran after chasing the woman inside a building. Police are asking anybody who sees him to call their tip line. Out of our Western Bureau, police in California going after a car that sped off during a traffic stop only to find a nine-year-old behind the wheel. Police found the car in the middle of an intersection. It wasn't moving, and after telling the driver, like, go, he sped away in a chase that ended near an elementary school. This kiddo said he was just trying to get to school. Fortunately, nobody got hurt. Out of our Southern Bureau, officials say the endangered small tooth sawfish they're dying at very alarming rates in the water in Florida. They're doing this weird thing where they're, can you tell right there, they're spinning around in the water. Experts don't know why. They're spinning and spinning, basically spinning themselves out of existence. Wildlife agencies are now launching emergency efforts in the first ever attempt to rescue that fish from the wild. To an NBC News exclusive now, with the CIA's top cybersecurity official sounding the alarm on threats she's watching heading into this critical election year. And at the top of that list, I bet you believe it, TikTok. There's been so much talk about it, especially as it's facing a potential ban in Congress. She says it could be a threat to your kids. As part of Courtney Cubies, their one-on-one -on -one sit down with Julian Galina, the deputy director of digital innovation at the CIA, stepping into her new role as the country faces all kinds of cyber threats, like the push to disrupt the 2024 presidential election, or to put computer worms into our critical infrastructure. Or that big debate, of course, over whether TikTok should be banned, over concerns about Chinese data collection and influence. You saw Court in the interview there. She is joining us now live, and we are so glad to have you because it's super interesting, um, especially the point there's been so much conversation around TikTok. She doesn't let her kids touch it. That's right. And she says she actually warns them off of it. And the, at the end of the day, the one thing that, that Julianne Galina really stresses is that she's very concerned about influence campaigns. So we're talking about efforts by, we spoke about Russia, we spoke about China, um, but other groups as well, foreign actors who may be trying to influence U.S. opinions. And one of the main topics that we talked about was surrounding U.S. elections, not just the 2024 presidential elections, but elections in general. And in fact, when we talked about some of the threats, including these influence campaigns, she said that at times she sees those as the more enduring and even concerning threat because they're changing people's long-term opinions. And that can be really difficult to counter or even get to the bottom of who it is that's behind these influence campaigns. But in addition to that, Hallie, Julianne said that she is very concerned about efforts again by both Russia and by China to influence U.S. opinions and even influence U.S. leadership. And, and, and that includes lobbyists and even U.S. leaders on Capitol Hill and some of their opinions and maybe even try to influence how, the, how they will vote, Hallie. Um, what else did you hear from her? What else stood out to you? Because there's so, like when you look at the landscape over the course of the next seven months, there's a lot. Yeah. So, I mean, I have to say, this is very rare access to talk to. Yeah. She's the senior cyber professional at the CIA, and she's only been in this job for about two months, and it's really an enormous undertaking that she has. Every single foreign adversary uh, cyber, potential cyber threat, that's what her unit is not only responsible or, uh, for detecting, but also protecting and defending against it, and then warning other partners in the U.S. But, Hallie, the one thing I was really struck by by Julianne Galina is her background. Now, she or she is is the senior woman uh, in this position at the CIA in the intelligence world and the cyber world, but she's not new to being a leader and even breaking through glass ceilings. In, at the Naval Academy, when she was a midshipman there more than 30 years ago, she was the first woman ever to be selected as the command, the brigade commander. So in other words, she was the highest leadership position at the Naval Academy as a woman, the first woman selected for that. And why that's so critical, we spoke to her, when I spoke to her about it, she explained that as a woman in this job, she faced some real challenges. Here's what she had to say. Critics would say, well, women are um, taking up space that should be going toward officer candidates who are going to serve in combat. And so questions would be raised about whether or not the investment in us, female midshipmen, was worth it. Remember, in 1991, women still were not allowed to serve in combat. And as a sailor, she wasn't even allowed to serve on some combatant ships. That's what drove her into the intelligence field, because women could serve as signals intelligence officers on combatant ships. Hallie, her first ship had 800 men and four women. Wow. Uh, Courtney Kuby, we're so glad to have that interview. We're so glad to see a bit of it. Thank you. There's going to be more tonight on NBC Nightly News coming up at 630 with Lester Holt. On this show... 
The candidate a lot of Americans want for president, now a real person. Meet this guy, literally anybody else. That's his name, next. Tonight, you've got the campaign, the presidential campaign in full swing. President Biden finishing that star-studded fundraising swing through New York. Former President Trump, he's getting ready to make a trip to the battleground state of Wisconsin. Yes, the general election, a race Americans don't seem to want, at least a lot of them. An election putting the spotlight on so-called double haters, meaning they don't want to vote for either of the candidates of the major parties this year. You might have seen it when NBC News sent Shaq Brewster out to talk to folks about this. Watch. What do you think when you see these two options? Not great. Oh, boy. Can't say that I'm happy about either option. Oh, hell no. Why is it them two again? It happened four years ago. If somebody steps up to the plate other than these two, I would consider it. Okay, so what are the numbers to that? 56% of Americans do not want Mr. Trump to run again. 70% were against a second term for President Biden. All of it kind of given the impression that some voters would take literally anybody else. Turns out, literally anybody else is running. A man literally named literally anybody else. He's an Army vet and a Texas teacher who, you see it on his driver's license, he changed his name from Dustin Eby to literally anybody else. He joins us now. Thank you very much for being on the show. So talk us through where the idea to do this came from. So it was just came out of a sense of dissatisfaction from the last election when it was the first round of Trump and Biden. You know, it was, I went to the polls dissatisfied, you know, and I thought to myself, it would be so much better if we had a way to kind of reset the election, you know, to have a neither option, you know, or just to say literally anybody else. And um, when Biden's term uh, started going around, you know, last year I bought the domain to for kind of commercial purposes because I thought, hey, why not make some money if uh, other people are feeling the way I'm feeling, just so mm. literally anybody else, T-shirt, the coffee mug, the candle. And but as we got closer and closer and further and further down the election season, you know, I saw the opportunity and and the value of the name to kind of gather attention. And, you know, and uh, just to kind of use that attention to kind of send the message, hey, like, we we need to do better. Hmm. And so. Well, so talk to me about that. We're showing your website right now and on it, right, on your platform, I suppose, you, you write mm -hmm. that literally anybody else isn't just a person, it's a rally cry. What are you trying to rally people towards? What is the message? So anybody who feels like wanting anybody else other than Trump and Biden, if that resonates with you, you know, that right there, it brings people together under one thought, one idea. You know, everybody has this kind of sense of like, we don't want this, but our voices are separated. So this kind of brings the chorus together to sing the song and hopes of being heard. You know, if, you know, we're just kind of separated and spread out, you know, we, we can say our piece, but I feel like we're not represented. And that's kind of the core behind it. Like, I want this campaign to be about representation, to be about, you know, saying this is what we want. You should, you know, accommodate that as the government. You know, we're, we're a democracy, you know, we're by the people, of the people, for the people. And if almost 70 percent of your people are not represented, no matter who wins, that's not, that's not democracy. That's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is supposed to be. Well, let me ask you this, um, and because I know that you are taking the steps to try to file, right, to get on some of these ballots. The ballot access is obviously critical for any presidential campaign, fundraising, et cetera. You've talked about your message here, and we're showing here the name of your committee, the committee to elect literally anybody else for president. And I ask this mm -hmm. respectfully. Is this symbolic, your run for the presidency, or are you serious? Is it serious? It's kind of a mixture of both. So I feel like... Mm -hmm. Uh, for the for the most part, it is a symbolic run, but any kind of uh, symbolic action without, you know, following through, it just it it felt hollow to me. So mm -hmm. I will continue to take the steps to get on the ballot, you know, because and you know I'm amazed at just how much support that this is getting. Like I'm getting calls constantly, not just from you know media and the news, but from everyday citizens. I mean, while I was waiting to come in here, I had 
two calls from just everyday people saying how much that they love what I'm doing and that they want to help, they want to donate, they want to get out there and, you know, get the petition signatures, not just in Texas either. This morning I had someone in Hawaii saying he wanted to be the boots on the ground there. And so it, it's, it's practically impossible. It's for all intents and purposes impossible. But the more support we get, you know, there is an unseen tipping point where it could happen. And so I will keep striving um, toward that right there. And if it happens, it happens. But at the very least, the message is sent. And it sounds like the message you're aiming, right, the message that you're aiming at are, are the, what we call the double haters, right, the people who do not want to see Donald Trump, the people who do not want to see Joe Biden in the White House. But there are other mm -hmm. options, right? I mean, there's a bunch of campaigns up and running that are meant to offer voters other options, looking at specifically RFK Jr., right, who we know is running, who just picked a vice presidential candidate here. Why do you think that independent campaigns have not gained more steam? If there is such an appetite, as you say, for people who don't want either of the, uh, the sort of big party, main party options? Well, it's exactly what I said earlier. I mean, trying to uh, gather these um, estranged voices into one uh, candidate is quite difficult. Like, I could have never run under Dustin Eby. If I had run under Dustin Eby, I wouldn't be here, you know, in this interview right here. So, so you're literally saying, like, the else, stunt helps to get the attention, right? I mean, that seems to be the thesis for here. Yes, the gimmick got your attention. Watch me as I earn your vote. That's essentially what this is saying. Let me That's ask you this, when this is all over, it, as you say, the core of it is being able to choose who you want the most, not who you want the least. Um, at the core of it, if this is all, let's say this is December and you come back on the show and we're talking and you're not the president mm -hmm. of the United States, do you see a future in politics for you? Is it back to the classroom? Uh, this is not, I don't consider myself a politician. I have, you know, a lot of, you know, what I believe good ideas for, for sure, but you know, I don't, I don't enjoy the level of scrutiny that, you know, politics would bring. You know, if this, this message right here specifically is, you know, like, like my friends say, the juice is worth the squeeze. Mm -hmm. um, but to have that kind of constant scrutiny for the rest of my life is just not something that I feel like I would ask for. It's not something I feel like my wife would ask for either. Yeah. You know, if you're that high profile all the time, you know, you lose kind of connection with who you are before then. And, you know, I'm, I'm still going to be Dustin Eby after November, no matter what. And I don't want to lose Will that. Will you change your name back? Oh, for sure. Win or lose. It's, okay. This was a gimmick, and I don't want to live the rest of my life as a gimmick. This was all about getting attention, um, forwarding the idea, and resonating with people who shared that sentiment. Thank you so much for being on the show this afternoon, uh, this evening. Really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Haley. We are coming on the air with divers heading back into the water in Baltimore for the huge cleanup of this bridge collapse with no timeline right now. A massive crane coming in to try to help. The president headed there next week. We're live on the scene with new details on just how dangerous this could be. We're also live in Atlanta with the travel trouble that could hit thousands of people this holiday weekend. The nasty wet weather a lot of folks are bracing for, plus your forecast in just a second. Then a Wall Street Journal reporter now held captive for a year in Russia. The new outpouring of support for Evan Gershkovich from his parents and journalists all around the world. Then an NBC News exclusive with the new cyber expert for the CIA, how she says the country's getting ready for the potential for foreign election interference, and why millions of Americans are spending big on fun and saving on none. We're explaining today's YOLO economy later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight we start with that huge, that complicated, that dangerous cleanup mission in Baltimore, with the Army Corps of Engineers calling it one of the biggest challenges they've ever faced. We've got President Biden heading to the city next week as the biggest crane on the eastern seaboard is now on the scene of this catastrophic bridge collapse. We're about to show it to you. You can actually see it in the next slide we're going to show you in just a second. Um, with hundreds of tons of twisted metal and concrete. That's it, right? This huge, this massive operation to clear that very important channel, the Patapsco River, and to reopen one of the country's busiest ports. It's now been four days since a cargo ship that lost power slammed into one of the pillars of the bridge, bringing it down, killing at least six construction workers. 
State officials late today announcing a plan for a new scholarship for the children of those men who died on the job. And we're also just learning divers are set to go back into the water now, freezing cold water, pitch black water. They're going to have lights and torches to try to cut apart the chunks of steel. With the governor warning cleanup and rebuilding this is going to take a very long time. The big part and one of the challenges is that the key bridge, which sits on top of the vessel right now, that that weight is somewhere between three and 4,000 tons. So our team needs to cut that truss into sections in a safe, in a responsible, and in an efficient way before it can lift those pieces out of the water. Tom Costello is following all the updates from Baltimore. He is joining us now. So the arrival of this crane, this is critical in this mission moving forward. Talk us through what the next 48 hours looks like. We've moved positions, Hallie, because we wanted to get closer to the crane. And here it is. This is called the one-ton train, the Chesapeake one-ton train. It is massive. I mean, it is a monster, monster crane. It is the biggest one on the eastern seaboard. And so now that is close to, we're, we're not far from, I don't know, maybe a third of a mile from the actual uh, bridge that's down, and that's over my other shoulder. I'm going to ask Rudy to just slide the camera over a little bit, but he's shooting into the sun, so bear with him. Not an easy shot, but right there you can see is the bridge. So we've got the, the one-ton crane on site here, and there's the bridge. And, and Hallie, i got to tell you, you can't appreciate why this bridge would have been hit, would have been hit and would have come down being hit by a ship until you see how big this ship is. Uh, you, and when you're driving past it, you realize, oh my gosh, this thing is massive. And in fact, it's about 985 feet, and that's almost as tall as the Eiffel Tower. I mean, it is huge. And it's stacked high, of course, with all of that cargo, and it weighs so much. That is why all of this has happened. That is why that, uh, that famous bridge has come down. When we talk about the timeline here, right, they're not going to immediately start using this crane to go out there and start pulling it out. They can't. As you suggested, they've got to cut all of these pieces up. They can't put divers in the water until they fully mapped it out with sonar and with radar. And then they will very carefully put divers in the water because it is very risky because that metal, the twisted metal from the bridge is razor sharp. They're worried that divers could cut themselves, cut an oxygen line or what have you. And they're very concerned as well that that entire, that entire rack, wreck rather, is shifting underwater as well as on top of the ship, Hallie. And you can see it too, Tom. I mean, it's windy there, the conditions. That is still such a question mark, and it's not the only question mark. Uh, the timeline, the expense of this to get this cleaned up, yeah. to get the port reopened, to eventually rebuild this bridge. The Maryland governor has been extremely clear almost from the jump that it is going to be a long time. No, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the Army Corps of Engineers would not give me a timeline for when they think that they're going to be able to open the port because there are so many variables, so yeah. many unknowns. Uh, outside engineers are thinking a month, but, you know, the Army Corps is not sure. We're going to have 40 vessels on site here within a week or so. That includes cranes and barges and Coast Guard and support ships, at least 40 vessels and barges on site here within a few days. And it's a massive collaboration and coordination. You just don't suddenly start pulling stuff up out of the water. That's they right. want to be as precise as they can be. Tom Costello, thank you very much for uh, that live shot there. Looking right at it uh, in Baltimore. Thank you. So listen, folks traveling for spring break or for Easter might get hit with some pretty bad weather that could mess up your flights or at the very least, maybe your picnic plans. You've got this big storm moving into California that has more than 20 million people under flood watches through Sunday. We're talking the potential for rain, for snow, for a lot of wind. And this holiday travel surge could mean a big impact on flights across the country. Those are the trouble spots there if you hear them. The FAA says next week will be the busiest of the season. We've got our team posted up at the airport, Priya Shadar in Atlanta, meteorologist Angie Lastman covering it too. Priya, um, how bad is it, right? I mean, this is a, it's not Thanksgiving travel week. We know it's not the end of the world, right? But there's a lot of people that are heading out for the holidays, for Easter, et cetera. Talk us through it. 
Yeah, and it's not just spring break and Easter, as you mentioned. It's also that total solar eclipse that's scheduled to happen on Monday, April 8th, that have a lot of people excited and preparing their own travel plans. Here at the Atlanta airport, airport officials say they were expecting 7.6 million travelers to pass through here between March 14th and April 7th, the busiest day out of that three-week period today. 335,000 passengers expected to pass through this airport. The good news in all of this is that so far the FAA is saying, reporting right now, that there's about 2,800 delays and 60 cancellations, so things are not too bad for too many folks. Uh, they're also reporting that the wait times in the TSA are not too, too bad. We did get a chance to catch up with some passengers here in Atlanta Airport to find out what they had to say about the travel chaos. Were you aware that today was such a busy no, day? No, no, didn't, it didn't dawn on me that this weekend's Easter, so, yeah. <laughs> Are you regretting your decisions or no? <laughs> uh, pretty much, yeah. I should have just stayed home. You never know what the security line's going to be like, and that just makes it stressful, getting to the airport, turning the rental car, get gas, do all that stuff. But TSA is always the unknown. So another unique thing about this spring break travel period is that this level of travel or this level of air passengers, I should say, is expected to continue into next week with the FAA expecting 50,000 travelers per day with especially busy days occurring on April 4th and 5th ahead of that solar eclipse that I was talking about before. So they urge people to get to the airport early if they can. Two and a half, earl two and a half hours early is what they're telling people to do. Also try to hitch a ride to the airport. Airport, maybe take an Uber instead of driving here because they're expecting that parking really could be limited um, in airports across the country. Hallie. Priya live for us there in Atlanta. Priya, thank you very much. Let's bring in meteorologist Angie Lastman. So lay out the timeline, lay out the forecast. What are we looking at? Yeah, so Hallie, we're looking at a couple of trouble spots, mainly West Coast. I think folks in California specifically, you've had a rough couple of months, really wet couple of months. It's helped with our drought conditions out there, uh, but it, it's causing a headache likely over the next couple of days. Right now, the heaviest of that rain is just south of the Bay Area, folks in San Francisco and points south of that between King City. That's where you've seen the heaviest of the rain. That isn't the only batch of rain that you're going to see. We've got a low pressure system that's going to work some rounds, repeated rounds of heavy rain onshore over the next day or so and into even potentially your Sunday. From San Luis Obispo down to San Diego, though, we are preemptively looking at the potential for some flooding. There's a flood watch in effect, more than 20 million people, and here's why. Here's a look through the rest of your day today. Yes, that heavy rain along the coast and parts of the mountains will pick up some additional snow, but even into tomorrow, we'll start to see some of the heavier rain working into Southern California, vulnerable areas for landslides and mudslides, and on top of that, parts of the, of the desert southwest are going to pick up on some rain and potentially some snow across the Rockies as well. By the time Sunday rolls around, a lot of places in California will start to dry out, specifically the Bay Area. But notice Southern California, LA to San Diego, still dealing with those repeated rounds of rain. By the time we get into Sunday, likely picking up three to five inches of rain in some of the mountains and foothill areas. That's where we're most concerned for those things I mentioned, the mudslides, the landslides, the flooding concerns, the washed out roads. We'll also pick up some snow. The highest amounts look to be across the Sierra range, maybe a foot to two feet possible, but across the Rockies, will pick up some snow as well. And we're not leaving out the rest of the country. There's just one little quick mover that we're going to have to watch, Hallie, over the next day or so to bring some rain to the Northeast and then eventually parts of the Midwest. Angie Lastman, thank you very much. Let's Got take it. you overseas now because the leader of one of Haiti's most powerful gangs, known as Barbecue, that's what they call him, he's now telling Sky News he's open to calling for a ceasefire if his organization of armed gangs is included in peace talks. Listen. Nous sommes dans le dialogue. Nous pour dialogue. Nous toujours pour nous pour dialogue. Mais le groupe qui est la classe politique, ça qui est pas là pour dialogue. Raison, parce que vous ne pouvez pas être ici dans le cœur, vous même avec nous. La classe politique qui a fait une exclusion, côté qui a dit que les bandits ne sont pas là Mais ce sont des façons pour renouveler le système, jean lia Parce que le système est venu en bout. Donc, barbecue as they call him. He's become kind of the face of Haiti's collapse into violence. He and the armed gangs he leads say the country has been controlled by corrupt politicians for more than a decade, with the UN calling what's happening in Haiti right now cataclysmic, saying there has to be immediate action, bold action. They say more than 1,500 people have been killed because of gang violence this year alone. Guad Venegas has been following the story for us. It is not often, right, that we hear from a, 
like a gang leader in a moment of crisis like this, but Barbecue is giving this access to Sky News, dismissive of the transitional government that's supposed to lead Haiti towards its next steps here. Um, and yet, uh, if you can call it a shift in tone, maybe that's what we're hearing? A shift in tone, that's correct, Tyler. So Barbecue is a very particular leader of a gang in Haiti. He appears to like going on camera. He's spoken to uh, other individuals on camera, some of it going on social media, but the, the messaging has been mixed. Now we're hearing uh, a different uh, attitude saying that he's willing to discuss. Now, the issue with what he's bringing up is that the international community, this is the Caribbean, CARICOM, and the United States backing them, as well as France and Mexico, all decided to back the decision to create that presidential council and the members of that council do not represent the gangs. And those are the ones that have been uh, designated to choose the next interim prime minister. So that's where the gangs have an issue because although they control a large part of Port-au-Prince and other parts of the country, they are not part of that discussion. Here's another part of that interview that uh, Barbecue gave to Sky News. En nous prêt toute solution depuis ces haïtiens qui sont tablant nous même nous prêt pour nous chita parler avec tout le monde parce que ça qui passe dans pays là nous pas fier And when he makes reference to what he says was a corrupt government, he's making reference to the former prime minister, Ariel Henry, and uh, other leaders of Haiti that the gangs believe, and, and this is also something, Ali, that I've heard with members of the Haitian-American community here in Miami, a lot of them immigrants that have recently come to the U.S., most of them telling me that they believe that the governments that have been ruling in Haiti were backed by the United States, and they feel like the international community has had a lot of influence in the decisions made by by those governments, and that's one of the reasons why the gangs and a lot of people in Haiti did not support Ariel Henry, who's the former prime minister now, uh, who's waiting to be replaced by whomever this new presidential council decides to name as the prime minister, and that next prime minister will have to work to hold elections. That's the one thing, Hallie, that the members of the gangs and the people of Haiti have agreed on. Everyone wants to see Haiti have elections once again yeah. to pick a new president. There's also the, the piece of it with the U.S. Um, involved in trying to get Americans stuck in Haiti out. We know the Biden administration has says they've gotten more than 450 Americans evacuated, essentially. Florida at the state level has also been getting Americans out, so far more than 100. At the same time, the U.S. is trying to get help in, right, humanitarian aid to the people who need it, food, water, medicine, and you've got some exclusive reporting about how that system is being taken advantage of, right? Right, because the system in place to ship goods to Haiti is also perfect for organizations, criminal organizations that smuggle weapons into the country. So you've got the official humanitarian aid that's sent by the U.S. and other countries, but there's also a lot of stuff that gets sent by individuals in places like Florida to friends and family, and they use these uh, freighter ships in the Miami area. There's an area in the Miami River that's also a port of entry, and it's a very interesting uh, mechanism to ship goods to Haiti. It's necessary for people to ship a lot of these humanitarian goods, but, but because of the way it's done, it's also very easy to put weapons inside a lot of these boxes. Here's part of a conversation we had with a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations. Is this a daily occurrence that you guys are finding weapons? It's a very regular, regular occurrence. It, it, sometimes daily, ebb and flow with it, but yeah, it wouldn't be uncommon to get daily weapon seizures coming out of Miami. And you can see the packages that were behind him. Those are the types of packages that get dropped off, and they can't be checked. There's no machine to see what's inside, and we're talking thousands inside of that warehouse, one of the many warehouses where people ship a lot of these items that, again, criminals take advantage of to smuggle the weapons, an issue that the United Nations has said is affecting Haiti, and the United Nations also say that most of the weapons in the country come from the U.S., and in particular from Florida, Hallie. Squad Venegas, um, we are so glad to have the depth of your reporting here for us as we continue to watch what's happening in Haiti. Thank you. You can see more of Guad's full exclusive report right here on NBC News Now. Keep on watching a little bit longer. That's coming up on Top Story with Top Tom Yamas in just a bit, 7 o'clock Eastern, right here. Also overseas, today marks one year since the detention of Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich. As his friends and family are thinking about everything he's missed while he's been behind bars in Russia. In a conversation with our Andrea Mitchell, listen. It's been a year, Evan is not here. We knew that it was going to be a marathon, but still had hopes that it will be sooner. We spent all four seasons 
there. He spent his birthday uh, and all the holidays, and we want him home as soon as possible. Look at the front page of the Wall Street Journal today. Dramatic and powerful. The headline, one year stolen. His story should be here. And instead, just a big blank space. It's because Gershkovich, of course, is in this notorious Moscow prison known for its harsh condition while he waits to go on trial on espionage charges, charges that he, the Wall Street Journal, the government of the United States all deny with the U.S. calling him wrongfully detained. President Biden today marking this somber moment in a statement saying journalism is not a crime. Evan went to Russia to do his job as a reporter and that as he's told Evan's parents, President Biden will never give up hope either of getting Evan back home. Keir Simmons is joining us now, the president talking about trying to stay optimistic. Evan Gershkovich's family talking about trying to stay optimistic. Um, and yet here we are one year to the day after he was wrongfully held. That's right. And the message they're trying to send is that he is a journalist and he was doing a journalist's job, that he is innocent, that he shouldn't be in uh, the prison uh, there. He shouldn't be appearing in uh, court the way that you're seeing there in those pictures. I have to say that the way that we've seen him, uh, he does appear to be physically fit and, and the uh, US ambassador has been able to pay visits and says that he is uh, mentally strong. But that message, they are just determined to keep getting that message out there. And, and let's just uh, look at another one of those articles in the Wall Street Journal, incredible powerful uh, copy of the Wall Street Journal uh, today. It, it says, Evan Gershkovich's stolen year in a Russian jail. There has been a burst of weddings and engagements of friends from high school and college. He's missed a year of monumental changes and intrigue in Russian reporting, a cornerstone of many his, of his friendships with reporters and a key part of his identity. And, and that just goes to the point, the chilling effect that uh, his arrest has had on on journalism. We should say that uh, journalists uh, in Russia who have criticized the Kremlin have been been crushed over the years. Uh, but what the impact of uh, Evan Gershkovich's arrest, uh, Halley, uh, has been that it's more difficult even for reporters from outside Russia to go there and tell the world yeah. what's really going on. And, and that's a crucial thing uh, that needs to be, that's a crucial story that needs to be told. Yeah. It, there's also this question, I mean, we've seen it with some of these other individuals who have been held wrongfully detained, considered by the U.S. in Russia. Yeah. And um, it's an understatement to say it is not easy to make deals, to do what needs to be done, to get them out. And obviously that is the case with Evan Gershkovich here. So what is the, what is, what do we know about the plan to try to actually get him released, as everybody yeah. says they want to see? Yeah, look, he's on, uh, he's in, on pre-trial detention. Uh, and, and that means uh, that he could be held almost indefinitely. He's not being tried right now. The hearings are about whether he could be just released from being held uh, for the time being, if, if you like. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it is a, a massive, challenge, not least because the Kremlin has pretty clearly indicated that it would like to see an FSB officer who's in jail for murder in Germany released. And of course, the US can't just tell Germany what to do. It, this is an extremely difficult right. puzzle. Keir Simmons, uh, we're glad to have you covering this important story on this critical day. Thank you very much. You bet. We're just learning in really just the last 60 minutes or so that Pope Francis at the Vatican has now skipped the traditional Good Friday Stations of the Cross at the Colosseum in Rome. He was supposed to lead this ceremony. You're about to look at it here. The Vatican says this is to preserve his health ahead of tomorrow's vigil and Easter Sunday Mass. The Pope watched tonight's ceremony from home, we're told instead. Now, this is the only event Pope Francis has missed so far in this very busy Holy Week leading up to Easter. This is the most sacred time for Catholics around the world. Tonight's event... Something that the Pope had to skip last year also because it was really cold. Remember, that was right after he got out of the hospital where he was treated for bronchitis. The Pope's still planning to be at the rest of the events on his schedule this year, giving mass this morning, trying to show some strength here after fighting health issues in the last few months. He's 87. He's dealt with not just the bronchitis, but just in the last year, intestinal surgery, lung inflammation as well. We will be watching to see the Pope, of course, this critical Easter weekend. More coverage to come on NBC. And the Pope is not the only one scaling back, at least to a degree, Easter weekend plans this year. The royal family is as well. After the palace announced Prince William and Princess Kate would be skipping Easter services. That happened when this video came out, as I'm sure you know, when the princess announced she's being treated for cancer. Kensington Palace 
even before then initially had said at one point that maybe Easter would be the date she would come back to public duties after her abdominal surgery. That is obviously not going to happen. But the weekend is a time when the whole royal family typically comes together. This year, not the case. The palace says the king, who is also going through treatment for cancer, will, however, attend services this weekend. Here's Josh Letterman joining us now. Different looking Easter, right? Not unexpected based on some of what's going on, the health issues that the royal family faces. But talk us through what we expect short term and maybe even medium to long term here. Well, hopefully this will not be the new normal, Hallie, where we have some of the top royals uh, out of sight, right? I mean, this is supposed to be a temporary situation while they are fighting cancer. And this has already become something that we've gotten used to uh, over the last few months. We haven't seen Princess Kate hold a public event since December ahead of that surgery that she had in uh, January, which was, of course, before they discovered uh, that she, she actually had cancer. And at the time uh, that she had surgery in January, anticipated that she'd be in the public eye holding events after Easter. Now that we know that they found uh, that there had been cancer present and she's undergoing preventative chemo, we don't know whether that time will be old or it will be longer until her. And as far as the king, who also had surgery in January, uh, they realized that he had cancer. You know, they've tried to find ways to put him out there for him to be accessible, even though with a compromised immune system, he can't be out and about like he would be uh, at a typical Easter, shaking hands with people and interacting with the public. It kind of reminds me in a way of COVID when we got used to trying to interact with people uh, via Zoom or other ways where we weren't directly exposed. And so we've seen the palace uh, put him out uh, in videos uh, in terms of react uh, interactions he's had with the Prime Minister and others, uh, including in a recording they released uh, yesterday. Normally, he would have given uh, a speech for Holy Thursday. Instead, they released an audio recording of the king. Listen to what he had to say. We need and benefit greatly from those who extend the hand of friendship to us, especially in a time of need. The king seemed to be alluding there to uh, all of the well wishes that have been coming uh, toward him and his family as both he and Princess Kate are now fighting cancer. Uh, and while that was an audio recording, we didn't get to see him yesterday. We do expect uh, that the king will be visible on Sunday at the uh, Easter service uh, at Windsor Castle, uh, even though he won't be quite as public as he would have been in years past. We do expect both he and Queen Camilla will attend that service. But we are told that uh, Princess Kate, uh, Prince William, and their three kids, they are planning to lay low this Easter and stay totally out of the public eye. Howard. Josh Letterman, live for us there overseas. Josh, thank you. Coming up, why experts say a big wage hike, pay raise for fast food workers in California could be maybe a kind of cop-out. Plus, why a Welsh rugby star wants to try his hand at good old American football. So are you spending your money like there's no tomorrow? Thousands of people apparently are with some new data showing we're in kind of a YOLO economy now. That's how the Washington Post puts it. A totally different reaction now than what we saw after the 2008 recession or even going back to the Great Depression when people hoarded their money. So what is a YOLO economy? It means a lot more spending on the really big flashy stuff, the things like you know, going out to see a big show. That live entertainment spending is up $9 billion from before COVID. There's like the big foreign trips, international travel. Look at this massive spike, right? Nearly 40 billion more from 2019 to now. But of course, with all this spending means less saving. You can see that in the chart here. Before the pandemic, people were putting away like 8% of their paychecks. That went way up in the pandemic. And then now it's down to just about 4%. You've got the Fed's preferred data today showing prices up 2.5% from February of last year to this year. Here's Brian Chunk with more. What's interesting is this idea of like a YOLO economy is reflected in some of these new inflation numbers showing things like services are up, goods down. Yeah, and one important thing to note, though, about the yellow economy is that it's only for a subsect of the economy, right? I mean, those that are lower income are likely not splurging on some of those more luxurious things. But look, at the end of the day, this is all reflected in the aggregate numbers that we get in the form of the personal consumption expenditures. It's just a boring term that describes one measure of inflation. And this shows that prices over the year over year period, February of this year compared to February of last year, went up by 2.5 percent. On a monthly basis compared to January, it went up by 0.3 percent. So prices are still going up. But interestingly, it's different depending on what 
type of price you're looking at. So prices for the things that we buy, goods, have actually gone down year over year by 0.2%, not much. But take a look at services. So paying for people to do stuff for us has gotten a lot more expensive, 3.8%. What are specifically getting more expensive? Things like, for example, airfare, as you mentioned. So you look at international airfare specifically, that is getting more expensive. Also take a look at financial services and insurance, motor vehicles and parts. And not just that, it's also insurance. So these are the things, again, that are services usually. You're paying for someone to fly you from New York to Los Angeles. You are paying for someone to mon manage your money. You're paying for someone to fix your car. So these are all really interesting facets of the economy, even several years out from the pandemic, Hallie. Okay, so then next question to our resident Fed expert. What is <laughs> What do these numbers mean for what the Fed could do about interest rates? I thought you'd never ask, Hallie. Well, <laughs> what all this tells us is that the Federal Reserve is still really not expected to do all that much. That's because right now the expectation is when the Fed meets next on May 1st that they won't cut interest rates. And they haven't cut interest rates for the last few months, although they also haven't further raised interest rates. Now, the question is, when will they start to cut interest rates? As this guy, Jerome Powell, has teased before, he's the head of the Federal Reserve, that could begin in June. Now, for what it's worth, these uh, expectations are coming from market pricing. Uh, investors are betting that it might happen in June. If that happens, maybe that offers a little bit of alleviation to the things that interest rates are tied to, like mortgage rates, like car rates, like uh, credit card rates, which have been very elevated as of late. So we'll have to watch what this guy said. This guy actually spoke today, and he was mentioning that the inflation numbers that we got this morning seem to be in line with the expectation that the okay. Fed might cut interest rates at some point. We just don't know when, Hallie. Brian Chung, uh, I'm glad we got that in. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Good to see you on the show. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, it's what's happening Monday in California, where hundreds of thousands of fast food workers are going to make a little more money. A new law is kicking in, raising the minimum wage to 20 bucks an hour, up from 16. That's big for workers because of those higher costs of living we just talked about. But some business owners we heard from worry they may have to close their doors. Here's more Barrett. The $4 an hour pay raise could boost paychecks for an estimated 500,000 fast food workers in California. But in the lead up to the new $20 minimum wage policy taking effect April 1st, business owners like Amir Samadi in San Jose project a pinch. As an owner or as an employer, you have to have like coverage to pay them. If you cannot, you have to shut your door. During the pressure of the pandemic, Samadi says he didn't lay off any workers or cut hours. With the new increase, though, he's not sure he can afford that same protection. A collective of franchisees for Pizza Hut and Roundtable Pizza already indicated plans to lay off at least 1,200 delivery drivers this year, according to the Wall Street Journal. Roundtable Pizza tells NBC News the franchisee is transferring their delivery services to third party, calling it unfortunate, but we look at this as a transfer of jobs. Pizza Hut has not returned our request for comment and has not said publicly the change is connected to the new law. Others said they've paused hiring or cut back on workers' hours. Governor Gavin Newsom signed the FAST Act into law last fall. This is a big deal. $20 an hour. Requiring the pay bump at any fast food chain with 60 or more locations nationwide, like Pizza Hut or Panera Bread. That's a 25% increase from the state's broader $16 minimum wage, which had grown over the last eight years. It's a result in part from a decade of fight for $15 protests. The movement now ballooning to a fight for $20 motto in response to inflation and higher costs of living. But this law is just for one industry, those who work in fast food. What is the point of having a separate minimum wage for fast food workers versus just across the board? It's very, very unusual to have a separate minimum wage for a particular sector. I still think there's this common misconception that Oh, well, that business owner makes a lot of money. They can afford it. That might be true, right? Um, but that doesn't mean they won't change their behavior. When the minimum wage goes, goes up, some low-skilled workers lose their jobs. And while it threatens those jobs, consumers could be eating the new cost, too. McDonald's, Chipotle, and Jack in the Box have already said they'd raise menu prices in response to the law, creating several losers in a play that was sold as one that would win. Maura is joining us now. Maura, it's great to see you here on set in Washington. Um, so as we're looking ahead to what happens Monday there, right? I know you've been talking with experts here. 
with some questions about whether a pay raise like this actually is the most effective way to help workers. Basically, economists... It feels like it should be. It seems like it, point blank, right? But the way it looks to economists, when you dig a little deeper, they told me it's essentially political theater. It makes people like Governor Newsom look really good because it says he's doing something. But what happens is you raise the minimum wages, the businesses feel like we laid out in the package there, but also you don't have to raise taxes, and then you don't really see any changes in the budget, budget deficit. It really just hurts those employees when the businesses can't keep up. Now, there is a real need for wage adjustment when it comes to this industry. The fast food industry actually has more workers living in poverty than any other industry. Right. But economists tell me that something like a tax credit for those workers would be more effective. That's interesting. Maura Barrett, thank you so much for that reporting. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, attorneys for former President Trump and some of his co-defendants in that Georgia election interference case want a state appeals court to consider removing the district attorney, Fonnie Willis, from the case. Willis's office declined to comment to NBC News about this. Remember, there was a recent ruling that let her stay on this case after Mr. Trump and others argued her romantic relationship with a special prosecutor created a conflict of interest. That special prosecutor has since stepped down. Both he and Willis deny any wrongdoing. Number two, health officials sounding the alarm on the rise of rare bacterial illnesses that can lead to meningitis, even death. They say rates of invasive meningococcal bacteria are going up now. The bacteria goes after the spinal cord and the brain and can be deadly. Something like 10 to 15% of people infected can die, but it can be treated and there are vaccines. Officials say, go get them. Number three, Kia, recalling nearly half a million of its Telluride SUVs because they could roll away while they're in park. Kia says there's a problem with one of the parts in some of the cars from model years 2020 to 2024. Fortunately, no injuries reported, but if you have one of these, go get it fixed at the dealer, they'll do it for free. Number four, the movie Oppenheimer, finally premiering in Japan today, eight months after it was released around the rest of the world. And it's getting some mixed reviews. Some moviegoers tell AP journalists they liked it. Others say they wish the movie dealt more with the horror of nuclear weapons on those affected by them. Number five, a Welsh rugby star now turned into the NFL. We're talking about 23-year-old Lewis Reese Zamet, and he's known for being very fast. That's what got him the nickname Reese Lightning. He's just signed a deal to play for the champion Kansas City Chiefs. He said that has been a dream. After the break, Russia's biggest pop star might get labeled a foreign agent by her own country. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's a look at what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of South Africa, investigators are still looking for the bodies of victims from a horrific bus crash yesterday. They say at least 45 people died. An eight-year-old child was the only survivor after the bus lost control and went off a bridge. The bus was carrying people from Botswana to an Easter event just one day after the government warned drivers to be careful. Since more than 200 people died in various road crashes the same holiday weekend last year. Out of Russia, prosecutors asking the Ministry of Justice to consider labeling the country's biggest pop star as a foreign agent. No official word from the Kremlin or the singer about this yet. Alla Pukachova repeatedly spoke out against the war in Ukraine. Labeling her a foreign agent means she could be in serious trouble with officials, but right now, she is currently abroad. And out of France, renovations are almost finished on the Eiffel Tower. Olympics officials say it's going to be the epicenter of the next games coming up this summer. An arena for judo and wrestling and a stadium for beach volleyball are all going up around him. The tower itself, like if you want to go up, visit, still going to be open during the games. And clearly, recently, it will be freshly refurbished by the time you get there. To an NBC News exclusive now. With the CIA's top cybersecurity official sounding the alarm on threats she's watching heading into a critical election year, telling us TikTok, which, as you know, is facing a potential ban in Congress, could be a threat to your kids. All of it. Part of our one-on-one -on -one sit down. You see Courtney Kuby there, along with the deputy director of digital innovation at the CIA, who's stepping into her new role as the country faces all kinds of cyber threats, like the push to disrupt the 2024 presidential election, or to put computer worms into our critical infrastructure. Or, of course, that big debate over what we just talked about, whether TikTok should be banned because of concerns of Chinese data collection and influence. You saw Courtney with that exclusive interview. Court's joining us now with more. We are so glad to have you because it's super interesting, um, especially the point there's been so much conversation around TikTok. She doesn't let her kids touch it. 
That's right. And she says she actually warns them off of it. And the, at the end of the day, the one thing that, that Julianne Galina really stresses is that she's very concerned about influence campaigns. So we're talking about efforts by, we spoke about Russia, we spoke about China, um, but other groups as well, foreign actors who may be trying to influence U.S. opinions. And one of the main topics that we talked about was surrounding U.S. elections, not just the 2024 presidential elections, but elections in general. And in fact, when we talked about some of the threats, including these influence campaigns, she said that at times she sees those as the more enduring and even concerning threat because they're changing people's long-term opinions. And that can be really difficult to counter or even get to the bottom of who it is that's behind these influence campaigns. But in addition to that, Hallie, Julianne said that she is very concerned about efforts, again, by both Russia and by China to influence U.S. opinions and even influence U.S. leadership. And, and, and that includes lobbyists and even U.S. leaders on Capitol Hill and some of their opinions and maybe even try to influence how, the, how they will vote, Hallie. Um, what else did you hear from her? What else stood out to you? Because there's so, like when you look at the landscape over the course of the next seven months, there's a lot. Yeah. So, I mean, I have to say, this is very rare access to talk to. Yeah. She's the senior cyber professional at the CIA, and she's only been in this job for about two months, and it's really an enormous undertaking that she has. Every single foreign adversary uh, cyber, potential cyber threat, that's what her unit is not only responsible for detecting, but also protecting and defending against it, and then warning other partners in the U.S. But, Hallie, the one thing I was really struck by by Julianne Galina is her background. Now, she or she is, is the senior woman uh, in this position at the CIA in the intelligence world and the cyber world, but she's not new to being a leader and even breaking through glass ceilings. In, at the Naval Academy, when she was a midshipman there more than 30 years ago, she was the first woman ever to be selected as the, command, the brigade commander. So in other words, she was the highest leadership position at the Naval Academy as a woman, the first woman selected for that. And why that's so critical, we spoke to her, when I spoke to her about it, she explained that as a woman in in this job, she faced some real challenges. Here's what she had to say. Critics would say, well, women are um, taking up space that should be going toward officer candidates who are going to serve in combat. And so questions would be raised about whether or not the investment in us, female midshipmen, was worth it. Remember, in 1991, women still were not allowed to serve in combat. And as a sailor, she wasn't even allowed to serve on some combatant ships. That's what drove her into the intelligence field, because women could serve as signals intelligence officers on combatant ships. Hallie, her first ship had 800 men and four women. Wow. Uh, Courtney Cube, we're so glad to have that interview. We're so glad to see a bit of it. Thank you. There's going to be more tonight on NBC Nightly News, coming up at 6.30 with Lester Holt. On this show... The candidate a lot of Americans want for president, now a real person. Meet this guy, literally anybody else. That's his name, next. Tonight, you've got the campaign, the presidential campaign in full swing. President Biden finishing that star-studded fundraising swing through New York. Former President Trump, he's getting ready to make a trip to the battleground state of Wisconsin. Yes, the general election, a race Americans don't seem to want, at least a lot of them. An election putting the spotlight on so-called double haters, meaning they don't want to vote for either of the candidates of the major parties this year. You might have seen it when NBC News sent Shaq Brewster out to talk to folks about this. Watch. What do you think when you see these two options? Not great. Oh, boy. I can't say that I'm happy about either option. Oh, hell no. Why is it them two again? It happened four years ago. If somebody steps up to the plate other than these two, I would consider it. Okay, so what are the numbers to that? 56% of Americans do not want Mr. Trump to run again. 70% were against a second term for President Biden. All of it kind of given the impression that some voters would take literally anybody else. Turns out, literally anybody else is running. A man literally named literally anybody else. He's an Army vet and a Texas teacher who, you see it on his driver's license, he changed his name from Dustin Eby to literally anybody else. He joins us now. Thank you very much for being on the show. So talk us through where the idea to do this came from. So it was just came out of a sense of dissatisfaction from the last election when 
it was the first round of Trump and Biden. You know, it was, I went to the polls dissatisfied, you know, and I thought to myself, it would be so much better if we had a way to kind of reset the election, you know, to have a neither option, you know, or just to say literally anybody else. And um, when Biden's term uh, started going around, you know, last year I bought the domain to for kind of commercial purposes because I thought, hey, why not make some money if uh, other people are feeling the way I'm feeling? Just sell mm -hmm. literally anybody else T-shirt, the coffee mug, the candle. And but as we got closer and closer and further and further down the election season, you know, I saw the opportunity and and the value of the name to kind of gather attention. And, you know, and uh, just to kind of use that attention to kind of send the message Hey, like we we need to do better. Hmm. And so well, so talk to me about that. We're showing your website right now, and on it, right on your platform, I suppose you you write mm -hmm. that literally anybody else isn't just a person; it's a rally cry. What are you trying to rally people towards? What is the message? So anybody who feels like wanting anybody else other than Trump and Biden, if that resonates with you, you know that right there, it's brings people together under one thought, one idea. You know, everybody has this kind of sense of like, we don't want this, but our voices are separated. So this kind of brings the chorus together to sing the song and hopes of being heard. You know, if, you know, we're just kind of separated and spread out, you know, we, we can say our piece, but I feel like we're not represented. And that's kind of the core behind it. Like, I want this campaign to be about representation, to be about, you know, saying, this is what we want, you should, you know, accommodate that as the government. You know, we're, we're a democracy, you know, we're by the people, of the people, for the people. And if almost 70% of your people are not represented, no matter who wins, that's not, that's not democracy, that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is supposed to be. Well, let me ask you this, um, and because I know that you are taking the steps to try to file, right, to get on some of these ballots. The ballot access is obviously critical for any presidential campaign, fundraising, et cetera. You've talked about your message here, and we're showing here the name of your committee, the committee to elect literally anybody else for president. And I ask this respectfully, is this symbolic, your run for the presidency, or are you serious? Is it serious? It's kind of a mixture of both. So I feel like, mm. uh, for the for the most part, it is a symbolic run. But any kind of uh, symbolic action without, you know, following through, it just it it felt hollow to me. So mm. I will continue to take the steps to get on the ballot, you know, because and you know I'm amazed at just how much support that this is getting. Like I'm getting calls constantly, not just from you know media and the news, but from everyday citizens. I mean, while I was waiting to come in here, I had two calls from just everyday people saying how much that they love what I'm doing and that they want to help, they want to donate, they want to get out there and, you know, get the petition signatures, not just in Texas either. This morning I had someone in Hawaii saying he wanted to be the boots on the ground there. And so it, it's, it's practically impossible. It's for all intents and purposes impossible. But the more support we get, you know, there is an unseen tipping point where it could happen. And so I will keep striving um, toward that right there. And if it happens, it happens. But at the very least, the message is sent. And it sounds like the message you're aiming, right, the message that you're aiming at are, are the, what we call the double haters, right, the people who do not want to see Donald Trump, the people who do not want to see Joe Biden in the White House. But there are other mm -hmm. options, right? I mean, there's a bunch of campaigns up and running that are meant to offer voters other options, looking at specifically RFK Jr., right, who we know is running, who just picked a vice presidential candidate here. Why do you think that independent campaigns have not gained more steam? If there is such an appetite, as you say, for people who don't want either of the, uh, the sort of big party, main party options? Well, it's exactly what I said earlier. I mean, trying to uh, gather these um, estranged voices into one uh, candidate is quite difficult. Like, I could have never run under Dustin Eby. If I had run under Dustin Eby, I wouldn't be here, you know, in this interview right here. So, so you're saying, like, the stunt else, helps to get the attention, right? I mean, that seems to be the thesis for here. Yes, the gimmick got your attention. Watch me as I earn your vote. That's essentially what this is saying. Let me That's ask you this, when this is all over, as you say, the core of it is being able to choose who you want the most, not who you want the least. Um, at the core of it, if this is all, let's say this is December and you come back on the show and we're talking, and you're not the president mm -hmm. of the United States, 
Do you see a future in politics for you? Is it back to the classroom? Uh, this is not, I don't consider myself a politician. I have, you know, a lot of, you know, what I believe good ideas for sure. But, you know, I don't, I don't enjoy the level of scrutiny that, you know, politics would bring. You know, if this, this message right here specifically is, you know, like, like my friends say, the juice is worth the squeeze. Mm -hmm. um, but to have that kind of constant scrutiny for the rest of my life is just not something that I feel like I would ask for. It's not something I feel like my wife would ask for either. Yeah. You know, if you're that high profile all the time, you know, you lose kind of connection with who you are before then. And you know, I'm, I'm still going to be Dustin Eby after November, no matter what. And I don't want to lose Will that. Will you change your name back? Oh, for sure, win or lose. It's, okay. This was a gimmick, and I don't want to live the rest of my life as a gimmick. This was all about getting attention, um, forwarding the idea, and resonating with people who shared that sentiment. Thank you so much for being on the show this afternoon, uh, this evening. Really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Haley. Right, we've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.